And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. 48 hours of nonfiction books every weekend. And we are on the campus of the University of Texas in Austin as part of our university series here on Book TV. And we're pleased to be joined by Sanford Levinson, who is a professor of law here at the University of Texas and the author of this book, among others, Constitutional Faith is the name of the book that we'll be talking with him about. Professor Levinson, do Americans have too much faith in the Constitution in your view? Yes. Um, I think that one of the exceptional aspects about the United States, there's a great deal of discussion these days about American exceptionalism, is the veneration directed at the United States Constitution. There is no other country in the world I'm aware of that has such veneration of its national constitution. And it's also interesting to compare the United States Constitution with the 50 state constitutions, um, that most Americans really aren't aware that they live under a state constitution as well as the national constitution. And except maybe in Massachusetts, because John Adams drafted the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, and it is in fact the oldest constitution in the United States. But otherwise, there's no sense of veneration or faith in state constitutions. Most states have had around three constitutions. Georgia and Louisiana have had 21 constitutions between the two of them. And there's a much more instrumental, what has the Constitution done for us lately, view at the states. They're amended all the time. Some people use that as a criticism of state constitutions. I actually think that might be a strength. The United States Constitution, partly because it is the most difficult to amend constitution in the entire world, and partly because of this degree of veneration has been amended extraordinarily rarely. Uh, I mean, if you put the Bill of Rights to one side, because that's really part of the politics of the original ratification process, since 1791, there have been 17 amendments. Um, and that's extraordinarily few. This me leads to all sorts of consequences. From my perspective, one of the consequences is that the Constitution is tremendously out of date with regard to some of our basic structures, which are very, very much the ones that were given us since in 1787. But it also means that there's been a lot of what lawyers have come to call informal amendment, where Congress or the President will act aggressively, and then the Supreme Court will basically uphold it. Or on occasion, the Supreme Court is innovative. Um, and what in some of the American states or in other countries might actually be the subject of formal amendment in this country takes place in informal ways, in part, as I say, because of a mixture that the Constitution is extraordinarily difficult to amend, and anybody who suggests amendment is going to run head on into newspaper editorials and the like of how dare you think of amending our perfect Constitution. Uh, I don't think our Constitution is anywhere close to perfect. I really wish we had a dialogue, popular dialogue, that addressed the need for more amendment. One of the things I find very interesting about the presidential race that's already occurring, particularly among the Republicans, is that there is talk of constitutional amendment, even though these candidates fall over themselves in competing with which loves the Constitution more than the other. But this doesn't stop them from saying that even though they love it, they would like to see certain things change. So that Rick Perry, uh, the governor of Texas, has proposed repealing the 17th Amendment, uh, which, which allows for popular election of senators. 
And it is, in fact, a very important amendment because prior to the 17th Amendment, senators were at least formally chosen by state legislatures, and you could make a halfway plausible argument that the Senate had something to do with protecting federalism because you could construct a story whereby senators would worry about keeping their jobs. To keep their jobs, they would have to have the goodwill of state legislators, and this meant that they would have to be concerned with protecting the prerogatives of state government, things like that. Once senators are popularly elected, they don't need to worry about state government. What they worry about is bringing home the bacon. And so from my perspective, the modern Senate is nothing more than an affirmative action program for the residents of small states. And I think that of all of the affirmative action programs in the country, this is probably the least defensible. Um, but um, yes, I mean, to go back to your initial question, I think Americans have at times the most ridiculous veneration for the Constitution, far more so than the framers themselves, um, who recognized that they were, and I mean this respectfully, not as founder bashing, that they were making it up as they were going along because there was no precedent for the United States Constitution. They were in this very, very hot Philadelphia summer trying to figure out kind of a first draft and I think they would have been astonished at the fact that there has been no con national convention since 1787, even though Article 5 provides for the possibility of one. And I think they would be astonished at how few amendments uh, there have been. Well, Professor Levinson, do you, in your view, does the Constitution prohibit progress? Or does it stand in the way? It certainly stands in the way. I don't think it prohibits. Uh, progress, but I think it stands in the way in that the, the framers in 1787 were basically suspicious of democracy. The original Constitution, even if compared to other political systems at the time, was more democratic. If you compare it to 20th and 21st centuries, century notions of democracy, the 1787 Constitution is significantly undemocratic. And one of the things that they f were fearful of, this is part of the um, anti-democratic tilt, they were very fearful of what they called popular passion and basically, I would say, rule by the great unwashed. So they put in all sorts of veto points. Uh, we have a bicameral system, which means that for any bill to become a law, it has to pass in identical form in both the House and the Senate. Uh, that's not written in stone with the very idea of bicameralism. There are bicameral systems around the world where you can break deadlocks, uh, where the equivalent of the House of Representatives could break a deadlock with a supermajority vote or something like that. We don't have that system. But besides the consequences of bicameralism, and part of that, of course, is a wildly malapportioned Senate. So it is one house that is roughly representative of the people, the other house is grotesquely unrepresentative of the majority of the United States because of the fact that Wyoming and California have the same representation in the Senate, even though California is 70 times the population. So for example, if one wants to understand why we have basically a dreadful agricultural policy, you have to understand the undue influence that the upper Midwest has in the Senate. That if the House got to make agricultural policy, we'd have quite different policies. But it's not simply that bicameralism makes it difficult to pass legislation. 
we really are in substantial ways a tricameral system because of the presidential veto. And 